I will briefly give first the overview of this presentation. I will talk about the applicators as a first point. I will try to put where in the context of cervix cancer, chemo radiation, brachytherapy applicators play the central role. Of course, this is a time of brachytherapy. I don't think that's a, that's a big mystery. Then I will talk about historical aspects about of, of intracavitary and interstitial applicators. Because knowing the history, I think is really important to understand what we can do at present day with this, with these devices. Then we will move to modern intracavitary applicators, which are available nowadays at vendors. And we will talk about their limitations, mainly about limitations of intracavitary applicators. <clears throat> And this will lead us to the final topic on interstitial techniques, where I will just give a short overview in view of the fact that probably the availability of interstitial technique with image guidance is nowadays still quite limited, quite limited around the globe, but nevertheless, an interesting topic I hope for you to address in this presentation as well. So let's start first with this first part. Okay, I think we need to move like this. So a typical uh, example of the treatment schedule in cervix cancer brachytherapy consists of uh, typically, let's say, five weeks of external beam radiotherapy. At least this is a schedule, a schedule we are using at my institution. You may be using something different, but likely the recommended schedules around the world should not differ very much. So usually it is a, some couple of weeks, let's say up to five, perhaps sometimes six weeks of external beam radiotherapy, followed by brachytherapy, which typically follows in weeks six and seven. At time of brachytherapy, yeah, is it working now? So at time of brachytherapy, we of course need to understand very well what type of applicator to use. And here we can see just one example of intracavitary applicator that this operator has used for insertion at the time of this brachytherapy procedure. Now we will move to historical techniques. Where, when did the applicator development actually started? Perhaps you would think this is a relatively new thing, but it's been a century since in Paris, in Institut Curie in Paris, France, first brachytherapy for cervical cancer has been performed using an applicator, as you can see in this historical drawing. And such an applicator consisted of, an, of a rubber tandem, which was inserted inside the uterus, and a pair of colpostats, which were inserted into vaginal fornices on each side. They were made of cork and they were coated with paraffin, so they were water resistant. Uh, Core colpostats and the rubber tandem were not connected, connected between each other, but as you can see, the cork were connected to each other. So, but there was no fixed geometry between the tandem and the ovoids. The distance between the colpostats was also not fixed. It was depending on the vaginal dimensions. So we can uh, conclude that these historical applicators had no fixed geometry, which is not a characteristic of modern applicators. This applicator was used by loading it with radium 226 and a certain amount of radium was left in place in this applicator for a certain amount of hours to arrive at a typical application, which was described in terms of milligram hours of radium. So how much of radium for how much of the, for how long it was left in place around five days, 120 hours would produce a typically 7,000 to 8,000 milligram hours of radium. And these units of milligram hours of radium actually still remain relevant nowadays. Of course, they are, they are re, they are converted to SI units or, or an acceptable unit system, but there is still link to this historical tradition of milligram hours. At approximately the same time, at the beginning of previous century, in Stockholm, Sweden, at Radium Hemet, they were using something similar as in Paris, but quite different as well. So they also used a flexible tube, which was inserted into the uterus. But instead of the cork colpostats, they used this box, which you can see here in these historical pictures. And this box was pushed against the cervix like this. This flat box contained, as you can see here, capsules of radium. And it was then coated in a, again, in wax protected paper and pressed against the cervix. Again, 
the flat bo blocks, the flat box and the tube were not connected to each other, so there was no fixed geometry between the two. The system was preloaded with radium, similar to Paris system. As I said, there was some radium in the box, which, which is represented here by the green circles in this draw drawing. And there was some radium inserted in the tandem. Again, a certain amount of radium for a certain amount of hours to give a typical treatment of 7,000 milligram hours as a product between amount and time. In Stockholm system, they did not use one application, but they divided it in two to three applications, each lasting of 20 to 30 hours. Later on, in the 40s, in the 30s, and then in the 40s, in England, Manchester, at the Holt Radium Institute, this system was invented, the Manchester system. And probably this is nowadays the most known and traditionally the most, perhaps the most important system nowadays. You can see this book here. This is from a library of my previous institution. I was very excited to find it. It is dated to 1947, this little book. And I also found, in addition, this historical Manchester applicator, which you can see here, a pair of ovoids and the tandem, rubber tandem, which was inserted into the uterus. I will now describe this system a little more in detail. So this is again this, this applicator, which I found in our institutional collection when I was still working in Ljubljana. And here you can see the rubber tandem, which was inserted into the uterus and a pair of colpostats like ovoids or two, like two olives, which are inserted in each vaginal fornix. A flange is very important part of the applicator because it prevents the intrauterine tube from sliding inside of the uterus and staying there, which would be a catastrophe because it is loaded with radium. These tubes came at, th at three different lengths, according to Manchester system, six, four, and 3.5 centimeters. And vaginal ovoids also came in three different lengths, uh, in three different sizes, large, medium, and small. Importantly, there was a spacer between the ovoids. So there was a fixed distance between these two ovoids, but there was no fixed geometry of this applicator in general. So the tandem moved independently from the ovoids. Again, the system was preloaded with radium, depending on the size of the ovoids and tandem. And this radium was left in place for a certain amount of time. And they could as well describe this in terms of milligram hours of radium. But in fact, what Manchester system newly introduced as opposed to those historical systems which you saw earlier, was the point A. So the point A, which is now still so widely used, is coming from this era. Point A was defined as two centimeters above the applicator, uh, above the surface of the ovoid, and two centimeters from the center of the tandem. It is bilateral point, it is defined on both sides, and the authors of the Manchester system then created the tables in this book, which I showed before, you can find tables which tell you for a given tumor volume, depending therefore on the patient, they would recommend a certain set of rules regarding the geometry, the milligram hours of radium, and the duration you should leave, leave this radium in place in order to arrive at a certain point A dose. So the dose was now described in units of dose, not in terms of milligram hours. And the typical treatment duration was 140 hours for 7,500 rads at point A. So this was first time that proper dose units were used. In the 50s, Fletcher took this historical experience together with later modifications by some French authors, and they created what is now known as the Fletcher system. It's made of adjustable tandem, where you can adjust the length, a flange, which, which is placed at appropriate distance from the tip of the tandem, and the cylindrical colpostats. The cylindrical colpostats can contain tungsten shielding or not, and, come, and the tandems come in different curvatures. The size of the cylindrical colpostates also differs, and depending on the vaginal size, we will choose an appropriate cylinder to insert for a particular patient. An important, an important <clears throat> asset of this new system was that the geometry between the tandem and the ovoids was fixed for the first time by a clamp. So until the 50s in the last in previous century, the system was independent. So the tandem would, use, uh, would move independently from the ovoids. And this was the first time fixed geometry was implemented. Now, 
I'm going to try to ask you a question. I do not have a polling system, but we do have a chat. So you just open your chat and type in just one letter, A, B, C, or D. And now, in a, now I will ask you this question. Which point A definition do you think is correct? Is it A, where we can see that the distance is measured two centimeters from the top of the flange up and two centimeters to the lateral on each side? Or is it B, where the distance is measured from the center of the ovoids two centimeters in the cran cranial direction, or is it C or is it D? And I've actually launched the Zoom poll question, so you can answer it like we traditionally do. Yeah, but it's not the right question, you know. You need to you need to answer in chat, please. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, so. I changed the question. I changed the question in the last minute. So I'm gonna uh, we're gonna cl close the Zoom poll and just okay. answer in chat. Is it A, B, C, or D? Just quickly. Sorry about that, Primash. No, I'm sorry for the confusion. So let's see. We have some, everybody said, most of you say, okay, let's wait a little bit more. So I'm just going to give an impression of, of your, it's not going to be a very detailed count, but yeah, very good. So I, I, can, I, can, I think I can say already based on the question and on the answers I see in the chat that I would say 90% of you would say that C is the correct question. And there is some of you who, who think it's A, maybe one or two who think it's B. And I saw one D. So mainly it's C, and this is the correct answer. As I have presented before on the Manchester system definition, it is two centimeters from the top of the vaginal applicators. So ovoids or ring, not the flange, not the center of the ovoids, and what is D? D is wrong because it is measuring from the lateral edge of the tendon. It should be from the center of the tendon to the lateral. You see, so C is the correct answer. Now, interestingly, uh -huh, we have to move like this. Again, just a repetition. The point A was introduced in the 1930s by Todd and Meredith. I'm sorry, I have to close the window. And it became it was introduced because we need they needed a surrogate for milligram hours or the total reference air karma which measures the amount of radiation and interestingly anatomically it is a point which corresponds approximately to where the uterine artery crosses the ureters or ureters cross the uterine artery and this is usually this is a place where the cervix ends it's a nice anatomical place but but the point is not really linked to anatomy. The point is linked to the applicator. I selected this question because it is quite common that there is some misunderstanding about where the point A stands, although it's almost 100 years old. So point A is an applicator point defined in relation to applicator to tendon and colpostats like this upper surface of the ovoids, two centimeters up and two centimeters to the lateral. Then, Later, even the authors themselves changed the definition that they first published in 38. And then if you look at the literature, it, even in the recommendations from some, um, how is it called, some international communities, you will see that there is quite a variation of what people think where the point A is. So this, although so, it, it's an unequivocal definition, it has been interpreted very differently throughout the years, which can lead to a large variation of reported dose. And this is why uh, recently in 2016, there were the ICRU 89 and ABS definition published. You can look this report up. It's a very extensive report. Um, this is the ICRU 89 report, and it defines point A exactly, and this is now a consensus between all major European and American brachytherapy associations and the International Commission for on Radiology Units. And they have agreed that point A is defined as we have now defined it here, as it was presented under C, and as 90% of you correctly assumed. Primas, can I stop you for a moment? Yes. One, I want to just thank you for clarifying that. That's a very confusing topic. As you said, lots of literature in recent decades have just uh, cited different different definitions. So that's very helpful. And I just want to take a quick moment to ask if anyone had any questions on what Primash has covered thus far. 
Okay, we will keep on going. And then uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free to ask me in the chat. Thanks very much. You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really it's really an important point, as you also said, and, and, and that's why, really, let's keep this in mind. This is now an agreed-upon definition. There has been confusion in the literature in the past 100 years even, almost 100 years. Now, I hope this is very clear. Now, we will move from this historical experience to modern intracavitary applicators. In principle, what happened between 1910 and nowadays, so in the last 100 years, is more or less... Almost nothing happened. The current modern applicators still mimic the historical applicators, and the developments that were are uh, that, that, that took place are in principle minimal. Here we see two major schools that were evolved from the historical experience. Now you know this Manchester and Fletcher style, which is mainly composed of the intrauterine tandem and ovoids. These ovoids can be like this, really like semi circular or semi half globes or cylinders and they have fixed geometry and the second type of applicators is the so-called stockholm style where this was where this little plate uh, or a box which contained radio 100 years ago is now replaced by a ring and this is still called the stockholm style applicators so nowadays we call modern applicators based on what system what historical system they were derived from we have the Manchester Fletcher style and the Stockholm style. And there are some common features between both styles, but there are also some differences. The common features are that the uterine tandems come from the, from the manufacturer in various lengths, angles, and curvatures. Another common feature is that you can buy different ovoids, cylinders, and rings of various outer and inner source path diameters. There is always a clamp between the intrauterine and intravaginal part, so the geometry between the uterine and vaginal part is fixed. But there are important differences between the two, and this may dictate your decision about which one you want to use in practice. If we look at the thickness of ovoids and rings, if the thickness of a ovoid increases, the distance between the source and the surface increases. So the, the the, the dose distribution in the tissue will depend on the thickness because the hyperdose sleeve will be located mainly in the plastic, in big rings, um, um, sorry, in big ovoids, and it could reach into the tissue in very small ovoids. So this thickness will vary with diameter. Whereas in the ring, it is constant. So with the size of the ring, the distance between the source and the vaginal mucosa remains the same. And it is always, almost always, smaller than in the ring. The next difference between the two is that the source path, path is oriented differently. When we talk about the Manchester style applicator, the Manchester style applicators have rings to have a ovoid source path oriented parallel to the vagina, as we can see here. Whereas in the ring, the source path is oriented perpendicular to the vagina and the cervical canal. The Fletcher style applicators are in this respect different from Manchester style applicators. And in the Fletcher style applicators, the source is also oriented perpendicular to cervical canal. So in the same way as in the ring. An important difference between the Manchester Fletcher on one side and Stockholm on the other side is the loading flexibility. For example, this is a Manchester type applicator here. Oops, I'm sorry, this was too fast. Here, we cannot load anteriorly and posteriorly because we only have two ovoids on each side. Whereas in the ring, if we need, we could load anterior positions and posterior positions for tumors that mainly extend anteriorly and posteriorly. Next important difference is that asymmetric insertion is possible in when we are using Manchester or Fletcher style applicator. If one side of the vagina is smaller, you could use a smaller ovoid on one side and larger ovoid on the other side. And this is qu quite useful sometimes. But in the ring, this is not applicable. Next difference is that adjustable spacing is possible with Manchester and Fletcher style applicators. So if there is more flexibility on one side, you could push 
the ovoid more to the lateral or even both ovoids more to the lateral, theoretically extending your dose distribution more into the parametria. Whereas with the ring, again, this is not applicable. Ring has a fixed size, of course. Now, if I just summarize these differences, there are some differences which are physically advantage of Stockholm style, and there are some advantages of Manchester Fletcher style. So it's very difficult to say which one is better. And clinically, mainly the centers are using what they are used to use. So the centers are using the applicators which they, which they are used to. But, but recently there was a publication which I did not put in here, actually coming from a, from a colleague from Canada, and who found that in a large analysis of more than 1,000 patients that were treated in EMBRACE study, that found that there are some overall advantages actually of the Stockholm style applicator. So the tandem and ring, because of this loading flexibility, seem to be seem to be somehow dosimetrically superior overall to Manchester and Fletcher style. Now these are some examples of modern intracavitary applicators, which probably most of you or all of you know quite well. We have a Fletcher system here. So a tandem and two bits, which are cylindrical and are perpendicular to the cervical canal. Then we have a ring and tandem, which is then the Stockholm style applicator. Again, with the ring, which represents this historical evolution of that box that contained the radium and intrauterine tandem. Then we have a cylinder for very narrow vagina where nothing else would fit. You could use a cylinder with a tandem. Here is another Fletcher. Here is a typical Manchester, Manchester style applicator where the ovoids are like a half globe and you can see that the source path in this ovoid will be parallel to the cervical canal. Then we have another tandem and ovoid tandem and ring example from another vendor and here is the, an, another example from Varian of a tandem and ring applicator. So these are some examples of modern intracavitary applicators, which we can buy from the vendors. And if you look at this dosimetrically, they do not really differ very much from what we saw a hundred years ago with Paris system, with Fletcher system. The only big difference is that they are fixed to each other and that we have better dosimetry nowadays. A very special way of using applicators for cervix cancer brachytherapy is the use of personalized applicators. It is likely that most of you will not come to use that. It is probably reserved to, to centers with, with, some, with some experience with that. And the use of mold technique is typical for French centers. This was provided, for example, by a, by a friend and colleague from Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris. And what they do is they take a, a, a print of vagina and then use this individually molded applicator and insert this into a vagina instead of the ovoids or ring. And inside the uterus, they insert the uterine tandem, as you can see here. 3D printing, of course, of course, is another nowadays quite popular modern way of printing such personalized applicator, but in principle, it's not different from this mold, which you can see here from the Paris uh, experience, which is also uh, almost hundred years old now. That's interesting, Prima. So they actually just put in the material to make the, make the mold and that's it. Exactly. They make the mold out of the, this is the resin, which, which is used in orthodontics, you know, to create mm -hmm. these tooth uh, impressions and they use the same resin and then they take it out. They put it in cast in plaster of Paris. When the plaster dries, they break it in half and they fill the negative with, with this, I don't know exactly what the material is, but it's some polymer, which then solidifies. And then they have another, again, the positive, which they can insert into vagina. Ah, really interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. And this is really a, actually a, a really an old technique and in Paris and other French centers, they have quite a lot of experience with that. It's quite comfortable for the patients because you, you may see there are little holes in here and this served in a, so that the vaginal mucosa invaginates into these little holes. So it will, it will sort of be kept in place and patients can even walk between, between fractions. They can, they can stay in hospital with this in place and they don't need to lay in bed for two days of treatment. They could walk wow. around. It's Interesting. Very, it's a very good tolerance. I will not talk about 3D printing. It's a very big story, but I don't think that 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 vital for, for our busy clinical routine.
Yeah, pretty much. I'll just stop you real quickly just to ask. There have been a few questions coming in. Okay. A couple of just back on the point A, if you don't mind taking a second. Yep. One participant asked if how you define point A if there's a retroverted uterus. Yeah. <clears throat> so I cannot show you the picture, but you you define it exactly the same as the as if the uterus is antiverted, always according to the applicator. So it's going to be positioned a little bit funnily in terms of anatomy, but it is an applicator related point. You ignore anatomy when you define point A. So if uterus is retro retroverted and your tandem is positioned to the into the is pointing to the posterior aspect, then you will just simply the points will be then located a little bit posteriorly. Mm -hmm. Always just just follow it blindly. Two centimeters from the top of the ring, two centimeters to the lateral of the tandem. That's it. Very good. Thank you. And another question. So in a patient who had sub subtotal hysterectomy and later develops cervical cancer, how would you define point A? If, if, sub, if hysterectomy was subtotal, so the patient still had has part of the cervix and probably has fun, you will insert the applicator. And again, I just need to repeat what I already said. You will ignore the fact that she had hysterectomy or partial hysterectomy. You will define it according to the applicator two centimeters from your vaginal part which can be ring or ovoids or even a cylinder and two centimeters to the lateral maybe i could add to this if in asymmetric insertion when you have a smaller ring a smaller ovoid on one side and a larger ring on the other side or or if the ring is tilted or if the ovoids are tilted again you will follow blindly two centimeters from where you see the top of the vaginal ovoid or the ring up, which will mean that in asymmetric insertion, one of the points A will be located higher than the other. Ah, so great. Interesting. Yeah. So they don't need to be at the same level. They just, you just need to follow this rule. Always 2CM up. Please go to ICRU 89 and, and look at this. It's, it's really very clear. Yep. Very good. If, Thank you. Anything and, applies um, to, all, to all clinical scenarios. And I'd like to just, you know, reiterate one of the points that you made earlier on about the high dose inside of the plastic. And so I think that's a really good point about looking at vaginal mucosal doses from your ovoids. As Primar said, the larger the ovoid, if you remember back from our discussion on inverse square and how sharply dose falls off from our sources, you can get the majority of that sharp dose fall off in larger plastic ovoids where that high, high dose and will be more in the plastic. So if you move to something like a ring, lots of times the ring has a shorter distance from the source to the vaginal meat. So you might want to look at your loading and make sure that you wouldn't load as much as you would with, say, a large ovoid, just because in order to get that same dose far away into the tissue, you would be having a much higher vaginal mucosal dose. And then one more question, Dr. Prima, I know you've touched on this before about which is better ring applicators or Fletcher. And I know you said that they each have their benefits in different ways, but from the study about Embrace 2, that lots of times the ring has shown the possibility for greater optimization. But if you, there's anything else that you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. I think you summarized it. There is, it is impossible to recommend that you should use either Fletcher or the tandem and ring because it mainly depends on your experience. So if you are a Fletcher believer, let's say, or user and have experience with this, it's good to stay with this because you built your safety systems into this process and you don't want to change things too much. But if you're starting, I would say probably ring has more flexibility. You have to be a little bit more careful with the high doses on the surface, as Adam mentioned, but the ring is quite nice also because of the fact that when you decide to move from intracavitary to combined intracavitary interstitial, the ring provides somewhat better basis for such a move. I will, I will talk about this a little bit in the second part of my presentation, but in this, in summary, I am a ring person, but I've used both. And I believe that there are some advantages to the ring, which I just found too, too appealing, not uh, uh, to, to go back to the, to the Fletcher system. But in principle, they are comparable, more or less. Okay. 
Is that fine, Adam, or uh, more questions, or should yeah, I go on? Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Primoz. Go ahead. All right. So <clears throat> we have now seen the historical evolution and how these applicators look, what are the differences between them. But now let's see how much they can do in clinic clinical practice. There are certain limitations of intracavitary applicators in terms of dimensions of prescribed dose. And to show this, I will show an example. I will show an example using a tandem and ring applicator as schematically drawn on this slide with a 30 millimeter ring and a 60 millimeter tandem. If we load this thing with the uniform, let's say loading in the tandem and four positions on each side in the ring, they are represented by the red dots. We don't see all four of them because they are just behind, yeah, and, and anteriorly to this shown one. And then we, <clears throat> then we get a certain isodose distribution. And if we specify the prescribed dose at point A, this is the schematically represented dose distribution that we will get. Now, let's talk about dimensions of this prescribed dose at different levels. At the level of the ring sources, the dimensions of a typical point A based prescription of such an applicator will be as follows. You will get a almost ellipsoid, pinched ellipse. You have the four positions here on each side of the ring, inactivated positions anteriorly and posteriorly. So this is pinched here at the region of bladder and rectum, and this is favorable. To the left and right, we have extension of the isodose, and this extension reaches up to 30 millimeters in tissue. This is as a rule of a thumb. This doesn't mean it's exactly 30, it depends on the size, on the loading pattern, but as a rule of a thumb, this is approximately what you can reach. So a tumor which, is, which has six centimeters at the level of the ring and is very symmetric could be reached with such applicator. At the level halfway between point A and the ring sources, the distance from the center of the, of the applicator to the edge of the prescribed dose is only 26 millimeters. So we lost four millimeters by moving only one centimeters up because of the inverse square law and this small, this big effect, effect of small distance. At the point A, clearly the distance from the, the center of the tandem to the prescribed dose will be 20 millimeters by definition because this is where point A is. And two centimeters above the point A, the isodose distribution is now practically circular, and we can assume about 18 millimeter difference from the center of the tendon to the prescribed dose. Now, if you know how big your tumor is, how it looks like, you can assume even without doing imaging with applicator in place, doing just an X-ray, you are able to assume if your applicator can reach this or not. If the target volume looks like this, then it will be nicely covered. So this is our tumor in the cervix. Cervix is gray, tumor is blue. The prescribed dose is red. And you can see this prescribed dose in this case nicely covers this relatively small tumor. What about if the tumor is like this? Then we have a part of the tumor which is not well covered. We would like to do something about that. And intracavitary applicators do have some ability to address such tumors. And what is this, what are the, methods or degrees of freedom when we try to optimize an intracavitary dose distribution. We could modify the dwell positions in the tandem and in the ring slash ovoids. We can do this by changing the dwell positions, so turning them on and turning them off in the tandem or in the ring, and by ch changing the dwell times in the tandem and or in the ring. So we have two options positions and times we can change. Oops, I'm sorry. We could also change insertion geometry, but of course for the tandem, we cannot change the geometry. Tandem is straight, it goes throughout the uterus. Insertion geometry can be to a certain extent changed at the level of the vagina, but only when we are using ovoids, as we have seen before. You can use a smaller ovoid on one side, larger ovoid on the other side, or you can stretch them more. You cannot stretch the ring more. This is where the ring is inferior. In, in functionality to the, to the Fletcher system. This is where Fletcher system is really better because you can influence the dose distribution by making the insertion geometry asymmetrical. So these are our mechanisms of affecting the dose distribution of the intracavitary application. How much can we achieve if we use those three ways of optimization? So if the tumor is big like this, we can extend the dose distribution to cover it. Again, we come to our example. In such an example, with a larger tumor, we could 
modify the dose here, increase the ring positions here, maybe reduce on this side, and the entire pear-shaped isodose distribution will move to the left. Now I will go back. You see this is standard, this is optimized. Standard, optimized. Now I'm just switching between the two, just to give you an impression what is realistically achievable with an intracavitary system. 34 millimeters at the level of the ring instead of 30, 30 millimeters at the level of the uh, between point A and the ring instead of 26, 24 millimeters at the level of point A instead of 20 millimeters, and up high about three millimeters more, 21 instead of 18. So this is what we are able to achieve with intracavitary dose optimization, not more. Of course, you might say, why not? We could just drag and drop the isodose. We have nice, those nice functions, graphical optimization, whatever you will have in your treatment planning system, you could pull the dose and just drop it off. Of course, but it's clear to all of us that this will also mean an excessively high dose at the vagina, probably also to the bladder and the rectum and the sigmoid bowel, all the organs at risk around. So this is what has been shown in dosimetric and clinical experience that how far we can go with blowing the vaginal and the intracavitary intrauterine sources without causing severe damage to the organs at risk. And we cannot go further than that. Primarsh, so, can I ask a question on that? If you go back one slide, please. Sure. So if you've got substantial disease on the patient's left side where you've optimized dose out, if you look at your EQD2 and you're still okay with REM bladder, um, would and sigmoid, and would you be willing to increase even further that loading past the 34 millimeters? In, in some situations, yes. It is not carved in stone, this limit. You may go 35, 36 sometimes perhaps, but you need to take into account that this will call, cause vaginal morbidity. It has to. Even if your rectum and bladder look okay, you do not have good methods to, to, to define the dose to the vagina because it is in a too high dose region. It's too uncertain to assess it. So if the, the most important parameters that show the dose to the vagina are, are points located at vaginal surface or five millimeters from the ring posteriorly, the, the so-called old rectovaginal point, and these are important points and they will become very high. So the patient may suffer from excessive vaginal toxicity. Now, if this is a postmenopausal patient for maybe for her, it's not that important. It could be considered for a young patient. This is something to be discussed. It may severely affect psychosexual consequences, but of course, if you can save her life with that, it is something to, it is something to consider. Yeah. But do not forget, you could address the excessive tumor extension by other methods, not by increasing this intracavitary dose. You should not go too far with it. So and one more, one more question asking the reverse. So on the, on the other side, the other ovoid or other side of the ring where you've reduced dose, are there times that you wouldn't reduce any further just due to historical reasons? So even if, let's say you've got the most advanced imaging and you can see that there's not really high risk CTV on that side or GTV. Is there a point that you just wouldn't really want to reduce just due to historical reasons? Very good question, Adam. That's, that's an important point. We do not want to reduce in principle those to point A below 65 gray in total. External beam plus all the brachy should even in the smallest of tumors never be low than, lower than 65 gray. This is what we know up to now. There are some studies which will start now in, again, in, in the frame of embrace research group where low risk patients will be, will be, will be de-escalated in terms of those. And we will perhaps dare to go even deeper than 65, but this has to be done in a study setting. It cannot be done clinically. It's not recommended to go below 65. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Primas. So the question is, what if the tumor extends beyond the prescribed dose like this? So this is obviously more than 35 here, obviously more than 30 here. So this is something you cannot achieve a good coverage. This is a situation where you cannot achieve good coverage by simply pulling and dropping your isodose. It will look good on the screen, perhaps in terms of the red line. But if you look at the high dose regions, you, you are burning the vagina in principle, causing severe morbidity. That's why we need other methods here. And other methods, of course, are boost. 
We have that different boost options for this. A well-known method, which has been used for decades, majority of centers nowadays around the globe still use it, is the external beam boost. And I will first address this. I will not address it in terms of what it can achieve, but mostly in terms of why it is, why it might not be the best option. Of course, if you do not have interstitial brachytherapy, which is an alternative to it, you will have to use external beam boost, but you will need to keep in mind that it has some limitations. And to demonstrate these limitations, I will just shortly show two studies without going too much into detail and, and these complicated relatively pictures and graphs, just saying that these three here, these three, part, these three lines, these three groups of lines belong to bladder, rectum, and sigmoid. And these two groups of lines belong to the target volume, so to the tumor. And this is the contribution of external beam boost using, uh, in terms of gray, yeah? So we use external beam to boost a patient with such a tumor, where the tumor was extending beyond, beyond like this, you can see here. It's extending beyond the dose distribution of the intracavitary application. That's why we used external beam boost, and you can see the dose distribution here. Now, what have we achieved? If you look at the organs at risk, we wanted to achieve a low dose, and this was our aim. This would be the line be below which these three organs would remain below a certain threshold for morbidity. In all cases, in these patients, in this small study, the dose delivered by the external beam boost to these three organs was excessive. At the same time, the dose to the target was too low. This is what we wanted to achieve, the red line, and this is where we ended. So in summary, external beam boost, if you look at it carefully and dosimetrically really assess where the dose lands, is like that. The organs will still get a dose, it will be higher than you want, and the target will not get the, the dose that you expected. So this is an important limitation. There is good experience with external beam boost from history, but things can be done better in the future. I'm not, I'm not saying this in a way that you should end this practice today, but that you should think perhaps in the future of replacing external beam boost with more modern techniques, which I will show later. Another study. Showing Can I mention one more thing, Primash? Sorry to yep. cut you off. Sure. Uh, one other issue with the external beam boost is matching the high dose from the brachytherapy. So if you if you do the external beam boost with the applicator in place on the same day, you've got a much better chance of aligning to the applicator and then delivering dose without um, overlapping high dose from external beam with high dose from brachytherapy. If you're doing external beam on subsequent days and you've taken the applicator out, the anatomy is completely different. It's really difficult to tell or where, where was that high 85 gray? And do I know that I'm not delivering external beam directly on top of that? Just some more sort of time sensitive and position sensitive limitations of external beam boost. Exactly. You, you really cannot tell once the applicator is out, even when the applicator is in to some extent, but when the applicator is out, you cannot tell what am I shielding now? Am I shielding the organs? Am I shielding the target? Am I adding the dose to high dose regions? Am I adding those to, you, you really don't know. There's quite, quite some uncertainty. And that's why the historical results are not as good as we hoped for. Now, new results with modern boost techniques are much better, as you will see later. There's another study, <clears throat> I will not go again too much in detail, but it showed similar thing. Just to summarize it, this is the impact of external beam boost compared to interstitial brachytherapy boost, which you can see here. Interstitial brachytherapy boost is, consists of needles inserted into the tissue and then loading those needles into, in order to achieve good dose distribution. And such a boost, when it compares to parametrial boost from external beam, is superior. And this is what this busy table shows, to summarize it quickly. And this will take us now to our next topic, which is the other boost option, the interstitial boost option. Instead of EBRT, we could use interstitial needles, like this. You could use interstitial needles, which you push through the ring, which has holes inside. And by loading these needles, you can extend the isodose up to somewhere here. By using additional needles, which, which will enter the vagina in oblique fashion into the tumor, you will end up pushing the isodose line even further to the lateral, something like this. So even for the largest tumors nowadays, 
I, for example, never use external beam boost. I would always put the needle to a place where it's needed. But we will see where, again, limitations of these techniques are, because this technique really needs then excellent imaging and also quite some experience and expertise. But just to show you some applicators which can be bought, and you probably know them quite well. This is a combined intracavitary brachytherapy plus interstitial. So combined intracavitary and interstitial brachytherapy boost. You can see the ring with drilled holes through which the needles can be inserted in this example here on the left side of the slide. This is the Vienna applicator. As you can see, all these applicators, almost all of them are named according to the cities where they were developed, not invented, but developed. The first invention, the proper invention came, came from Vienna. And based on this invention, other authors modified the applicators coming up with the Utrecht applicator, as you can see here. This is a Fletcher system with holes for the needles. Then Geneva applicator, another Fletcher system with holes for the needles. This is the interstitial tandem and ring applicator, where again, where needles can be inserted also through a re inner ring close to the tandem. This is an Arhus applicator. Arhus is a city in Denmark and Venezia applicator. And I think we all know this city as well. So uh, there is a tendency to name applicators according to cities, because of course, authors would like to name them by themselves, but that would look a bit, a bit presumptuous. Now, pure interstitial brachytherapy boost can also be used if you use such uh, applicators as MAPIT applicator or applicators, which you can also make by yourself from plexiglass or such vaginal plexiglass applicators. And here is one example from my colleague from India. Umesh Mahanchetti using such a homemade, let's say hospital made plexiglass applicator to insert the needles into paravaginal tissue in a patient with very extensive paravaginal and parametrial disease. Now these applicators require perhaps or, or perhaps even more skill than the ones I showed before. We can reach, I will skip this and show here, we can reach with our intracavitary applicators as we have seen before in my example of optimizing the intracavitary application, we could reach a tumor which is up to 25 millimeters away from the tandem at the level of point A. So we can stretch the isodosis up to perhaps five millimeters, four to five, as you remember. Now having the needles in parallel to the tandem inserted through the ring, we can increase this distance up to 30 millimeters. And if we add oblique needles, this distance can be then extended up to 40 milliliter, millimeters. If we would add another level of oblique needles, of course, you can go even further out. And with this technique, we can really achieve good coverage of practically all cases, even the most extensive ones. It has, I, I don't remember a case in, in, in practice where interstitial technique could not cover the entire tumor. Now, can I interrupt you uh, one more time? Can you go back one slide? Yes. We've got lots of interest in interstitial, which I'm excited about. So in our last uh, brachytherapy curriculum, we had a number of institutions that pursued interstitial with success. And I want to say one thing that this lecture is an introduction to interstitial. So if any of you out there are interested in pursuing interstitial clinically in your departments, again, reach out to RCC and we'll have experts be able to partner with your institutions and really help you to um, implement it safely and effectively. But I think it's a great thing to pursue. The cure rates on patients are much better. But a couple quick questions, Dr. Patrick, one second. One, one participant wanted to know what sort of imaging devices would you use for the needle insertions? Okay, I will now come to this in the next slide. Okay, so then I'll get to another one and you'll get to that. Is, yeah. is it too painful when inserting ne interstitial needles and how do you account for the pain? Anesthesia is, is, is a must. Anesthesia is a must, spinal or general. You Perfect. could do, you can do intracavitary in paracervical block, perhaps even with strong analgesia and sedation, but for, for needles, you need, you need short general anesthesia or spinal. Very good. Thank you. And a quick question about your loading on needles here on mm -hmm. this, on this page. So you've got about 10 to 20% relative to intracavitary and 5 to 10% for oblique as sort of a rule of thumb. At what point would you increase this and how much would you increase that in order to cover tumor if your just needle geometry isn't ideal? That's an, adva that's an advanced question. And uh, 
you you could you could go beyond 20%. So we like to keep the the needles relatively warm, not hot, and not cold. So the intracavitary application in this combined application should still play, should still carry most of the loading, should still give most of the dose. The needles just add this little bit because they're at the edge. You don't need to load them much to push the dose quite quite strongly outwards. And typically it's 10 to 20 for parallel and up to up to up to five to ten for oblique needles. I would go, let's say, up to 30, in some cases up to 40 percent. When the needles are far from the organs at risk, especially if they are located in the center of the of the tumor. And in the next slide, you will see such example. So let's let's now for now ignore these first two pictures. Just have a look at the third picture where you can see the tendon in the center of this. Do you see my mouse? Yeah. So you can see the tendon in the center and you can see some needles here. Here is one and there is one and there are more. And as you can see, this is exactly answer to your question, Adam. This needle over here is close to the bladder. This needle over here is close to the rectum. This needle over here is in the center of the tumor. I could, in principle, load this needle here as heavily as tandem. I could completely ignore this rule of a thumb of 10 to 20% because it's in the tumor. But this one here, close to the bladder, I was very conservative. It's hardly even loaded. As you can see from those distribution, you can see some 300% 300 This is the orange line. E even 300% isodose line here. And there are small 300% here. And here we don't even see 150. So very shy loading on the periphery and relatively heavy loading in the center in this complex implant with the tandem and one, two, three lines of needles. So here we used a parallel line, an oblique line, and the second oblique line. Again, as you said, I think for centers with interest in this topic, results, clinical results are really better. Please, as, as Adam pointed out, contact RCC and perhaps something can be arranged because this is really an interesting topic, but it's, it's quite complex and it would require a separate course to address such complicated techniques. But in principle, there was a good question from the audience about imaging. So for insertion of these needles, I would always use ultrasound. So live ultrasound to see where the needle is going. You can see the tumor very well on transrectal ultrasound. And you can see the needles as you push them in. Once the needles are in, so the needles are being inserted here, you can see the vagina, the, the ring with the holes. Two needles are already in place and the third needle is coming in. The transsectal ultrasound will be used so that the, the, the lower speculum will be removed and the transsectal probe will be inserted in order to see how this needle is progressing. So as I can see that it is reaching the, the, the proper place. There are some situations where you could omit transsectal ultrasound if the application is really relatively simple. You could even say, okay, without ultrasound. But you always need, after the needles have been inserted, so, one part of the answer is you need ultrasound for insertion or for some situations you could even proceed without ultrasound. But after the needles are inserted, you cannot like you used to in intracavitary or like you do now in intracavitary, you can do two x-rays and plan. Of course, with some limitations. Here, once you have needles, it's really, really challenging to do that. And it is highly or even not only recommended, but it's necessary to do some imaging. This could be MRI or CT. MRI is very difficult to get, and that's why CT is becoming a relatively well available resource nowadays all around the globe. We use it for external beam. We use it even for palliative cases in external beam. So really, we as brachytherapists should also fight to get it for our cervix cancer patients. So you can, you can do interstitial brachytherapy without MRI by using CT. And you can achieve such implants, you will not see so nice as you can see here because it's MRI, but you can see well enough to do good treatment with proper training. But this is the, this is the, this is the process. Personalized application using ultrasound followed by imaging with applicator in place, followed by personalized dose optimization and then treatment. Then we have here one clinical example. Oh, this is actually the patient we just saw. So this is the tumor, the big tumor. This is what you could achieve with intracavitary applicator alone. And as you can see, a lot of the tumor is outside. 
Now, it is impossible really to boost this accurately with external beam because parts are behind the dose distribution, parts are in front here. If you shield this, if you shield the bladder and rectum, you will also shield this part of the tumor up to here. So all this significant volume will be shielded. That's why using the needles for interstitial boost is a better way to go. And these are the clinical results of such approach showing that uh, this is the EMBRACE study, which was published last year on 1,300 patients using uh, such image-guided intracavitary and interstitial brachytherapy. Of course, local control is excellent for small tumors, 1B1 and 1B2. It always was. This is not new. We are as good as surgery. But what is astonishing is that 3B and 4A disease, which in the old days had perhaps 20, 30, 40% maybe local control, or even 4A commonly was used or, or was referred only for palliative treatment. Nowadays, look, I'm going back, sorry. Nowadays, look, 4A, 91%. So it's here. So even the most extensive disease with invasion of bladder and rectum can be cured with these techniques. And as I said, we don't need to use MRI. CT is a favorable and affordable alternative to MRI. We have recently published these recommendations, again, combined between Indian Brachytherapy Society, Jack Estor, this is European Brachytherapy Society, and American Brachytherapy Society on how to use CT for image-guided brachytherapy. If you find these recommendations and look at them, I'm also happy to send them to Adam and maybe you can distribute if, if it's difficult to get to the... But, but I think it's free. I think this is free <clears throat> online. You can, you can download it free from the journal site or from PubMed. And just go through this and you will see, you can learn this. It's not easy. It's, 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 it's not easy, but one can use CT for good intracavitary interstitial brachytherapy. And we will even start a study shortly. And if any centers would be interested in participating in this study, it will be a registration study for, new, for centers that cannot afford MRI, but could use CT for planning. And we will be happy to, and we will be also organizing some education in, in, in frame of this study. Primoz, can you send me that information? I would love to distribute that to the group. About the study and- the Yep. Sure. Yeah. And I'll yeah, I think that would be highly recommended for anyone interested in getting into more optimized treatments. I think so. And I think the timing is well, is really nice now. It's really good because the study protocol is still being prepared. We are not starting tomorrow or in two weeks or in a, perhaps not even in a year. So you would have quite some time to prepare for this. If some centers are interested in this, the study will probably kick off maybe in a year and a half. Great. Perhaps and even then, later, and it will be possible to join later. So there is some time, but what I would like really as, a, as an important take home message, of course, I can make my formal conclusions here, but my important take home message here is we don't need to stay in the past with the parametrial boost with external beam radiotherapy. We can move forward. We can do so even with moderate, uh, modest resources, European community, American community, to some extent, even Indian community of brachytherapy, they, they have significant resources and they can do MRI and, and, and very, very advanced treatments and MRI based treatments. But, but the burden of cervix cancer is the highest in countries which cannot afford these highly expensive treatments. And this is a, a, a terrible irony. And to overcome that irony, we are really there is a group within this European group, and I'm part, I am a part of this group. We are really working hard to create this city-based environments where people can also do these complex treatments without major cost and achieving great benefit. So that's the major message. Don't be too shy or too afraid of stepping out of that box, and we'll be happy to help. Now my conclusions, well, we, you have seen modern intracavitary applicators in principle, they have the same concept as historical systems, but the main difference, differences are that nowadays they are fixed. They are compatible with MRI, for example, some of them with CT, they have smaller channel diameters so that they can, that we can use small sources. The three main types of intracavitary applicators are the Stockholm style. This is the tandem and ring coming up from that historical system with the box and radium. 
We have tandem and ovoids, which historically referred to the Manchester and Fletcher style applicators. And we have this special technique of mold technique from, from, from France or 3D printing perhaps nowadays, which is very individualized and super advanced, but, but very good for the patients. Intracavitary technique alone is required, absolutely necessary, and we need to use it in every cervix cancer patients. Patient, BRAC external beam radiotherapy cannot replace that, but it has some limited possibility for dose adaptation. So we recommend a boost for tumors with unfavorable topography, which cannot be covered by intracavitary technique alone. And this boost, boost can be either external beam boost. So you should use it if you don't have interstitial ability, but if you are interested, I would recommend considering moving to interstitial brachytherapy boost where certain expertise will need to be developed certain resources will definitely be required and imaging will be needed without imaging you cannot do this but as i said ct as a relatively relatively cheap modality can be used instead of mri and this this is where i end my presentation. great thank, thank you, you dr primars this was amazing and i think the questions show the intrigue in your presentation so it's much appreciated from from everyone i've got one one more question here that i think is really good and I'll sort of have a follow-up on that. So for such a big tumor, is it not better to use external beam prior to brachy? And I'll take that one further. Um, one, uh, I'll ask one more follow-up question on that. So sometimes there are limitations or time limitations in a brachytherapy patient where a patient needs to have brachytherapy before finishing external beam. Maybe it's an issue with the patient living outside of town or whatever it might be, sometimes that happens. We're just scheduling within the clinic, staff schedule, imaging schedule, that sort of thing. Sometimes the patient has to start early. What sort of detriment would a patient like that have with a larger tumor having to have brachytherapy sort of before the end of external beam? Yeah, to the first question, yes, this patient was of course treated with, with external beam upfront. <clears throat> what you see now is this big extensive residual is perhaps just 50% of the tumor which was there at time of diagnosis. So she had quite a good regression during the five weeks. That's why I'm showing this slide again. This is our standard practice and we, we always do external beam upfront and only then after some regression of the tumor, which is usually up to 75%, 80% on the average, sometimes even total remission, then we use brachytherapy. But in cases where logistics demand that you start with brachytherapy before BRT is over, of course, you will end up with bigger tumors more often. And, and for that, it is not clear what is the detriment on, 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 on patients. No such comparisons have been made. Some centers have been using this even, even as standard as, as if I'm not mistaken for quite some time, Pittsburgh was using five weeks of external beam and on each week, one brachy starting week one. So, and the ma major limitation was, as you mentioned, that the tumor was so big in week one that they just could not really reach it. So that's why as a rule, we always do external beam upfront in cases, which, which still remain as big as this one, as you saw before, maybe I can go back to that picture, such as this one. Well, if you have the expertise as we had, as you can see here, I do not see any better solution than that. So this really covers the residual tumor. And Adam, if your patients came in fourth week with such a tumor, you could use the same interstitial technique to achieve this. But that said, it's not that easy to do that. It's, you need some learning curve. You need some experience. You need some patients that will not go so well <laughs> before you get one right. So a lot of training is needed. It's like with any procedure. And if, if, if I am unsure about my technique, if I would say I'm not, I'm not ready yet to, to implant such a big tumor, then I would agree with the question from the participant and say, well, maybe I will not stop at 45 gray external beam in this case, I will go up to 54. And then I will see if the tumor is any smaller. It's not smaller. Mm, I will dare to go even a little bit higher maybe, but not much more. This is extreme because by reducing the, the, the contribution from, from brachytherapy and increasing contribution of external beam radiotherapy, always, this is a rule, you can do calculations yourself on the, or read the literature, always ends up at, with the disadvantage for the organs at risk. Because external beam, as a rule, gives more to organs at risk than, than good brachytherapy. 
Yes, thank you so much. Pretty much confusing, confusing answer. I hope I hope it was okay. No, no, it's very good, very, very, very helpful. Another question: EBRT and brachytherapy. So you've shown the schedule to typically about five weeks of external beam followed by about two weeks of brachytherapy. Is there two questions? Is there a total time frame that you'd like to deliver everything? And two, what would be your typical regimen? So following your say about 25 to 28 fractions of external beam, how many fractions of brachytherapy and in what schedule would you typically deliver? Yeah, we always try to keep the overall treatment time below 50 days. There's quite a lot of evidence for that. Each day beyond 50 days is approximately 0.6 gray lost. So if you go to 60 days, you might consider adding six gray if you go to 60 days. So increasing the dose, the time for 10 days, you might consider adding six gray to compensate for that loss. The schedule, we usually, we typically use a schedule of 45 gray in first five weeks, and then week six and seven, four fractions of brachytherapy, each fraction seven gray. But only, but this is an optimized dose distribution. If you would, if you would give four times seven to point A, this might end up in, in unfavorable doses to organ trees. This needs to be an optimized treatment.